Yeah. All right, well, um, I'm Edwin Nichols. I'm a clinical industrial psychologist living in Washington, DC. I have a small company called Nichols and Associates, which is a research institute for applied behavioral science. I work with organizations to help them be more efficient in how they do the work. And I work with organizations to help them to improve the staff so the staff is more culturally competent. And I thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing some concepts and ideas with your audience today. Yes. yes. Whenever I approach uh, a problem, I always approach it from a philosophical basis. And that is, if we start to talk about issues and we don't know the value system of the people with whom we are working or how they solve problems or how they reason to answers, then we don't know how to manipulate or to work with them successfully. So I want to share uh, two groups of people. I want to share our own group, the African perspective. Um, in classical philosophy, axiology is the study of values. So the value system for us as African and Africans of the diaspora is one is, is a one-on-one -on -one relationship. The highest value lies in the relationship. So if you look at my hands, you can see that we, we see ourselves to be equal to each other. You hear people talking about, you know better than me, you know? So we are looking at each other as being equal. Now, if you do something from my perspective or you do do something that treats me as less than equal, you have treated me with disrespect. And then that's the most crucial issue that destroys relationships. If you go to prisons and you ask young men, why would they kill a cousin, a brother, a best friend? They say, man, he treated me with disrespect or he dissed me in, in the vernacular of America. So being treated with disrespect or perceiving that you're being disrespectful, treated with disrespect, destroys a relationship. Now, the way that we know our epistemology is that we know things intuitively. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, silly things. It says that we can see something and immediately without trying to count it, measure it, and categorize it. We know it at that moment. Now, the problem with that is it is not repeatable and, redu and reproducible. It comes as an instant. It's an intuit something. So let me give you an example. Uh, if I say chair, everyone in the audience then makes a photograph of what they see as the chair. We could pass those around to everyone in your audience and each person would identify that object, no matter how differently they look, as a chair and not as a table. Now, what is it that enables us to see each of those different objects and understand them to be chair? Well, that is to intuit or an intuitive knowledge, okay? Now, the, the, if the highest value is in the relationship and you have an opinion and I have an opinion, Western culture uses a logic system which is dichotomous. So if I'm right, you're wrong. If you're right, I'm wrong. Well, mm -hmm. if the highest value is in the relationship, can that be our logic system? No, we have to have a logic system that says, you have an opinion, I have an opinion, and we have to work to bring the yes. two together. Yes. So that's called diunital. The Spanish use the same, the, the Caribbean um, Hispanics, they all use the same logic system and it was given to them by the Aztecs and it's called the diaspora. I, I'm sorry, it's called diaphrasismo. The Arabs also have it. It's called the in between, your opinion, my opinion, and the in between is the logical answer. Now, when we go to Europeans, we are looking at people who have the highest value in the object. And you have to determine in your own mind, what is that object that they have in their mind that is so valuable in terms of their interaction with us? The way they know something is through counting it and measuring it. And their logic system is either or. This is the object or it is not the object. It's an either or. So now let's look at these first questions about uh, slavery. Yes. You have- Emancipating our selves from mental slavery. Yes. That's the, the topic, yes. Yes, okay. If you, 
emancipate yourself from slavery. You have to understand what did it do to you in the first place. So in the first place, slavery completely dehumanized the individual. And it broke the will of the individual to, to escape or to fight. This was done uh, in different manners. The Dutch were the cruelest people because they would hang a person on a hook going into the heart and lungs and hang them up on this hook with their hands tied behind their back and their feet tied and let them hang there until they die. And everyone stood around to watch that. Now, if you have that horror, what is the likelihood that you're going to be anything other than compliant unless you want something similar to happen to you? Now, in the Jamaican islands and in the other British islands, then they used force. You had some people in Jamaica, because it's so large, that were able to be marooned, so they could run away and hide. But at a certain point, the British with their troops came and got them too. So it's always a, a concept of force. So what we see today in terms of slavery or the, the ramifications of slavery is that we are traumatized in our genetic makeup. And that genetic makeup is still there with the trauma. That trauma then is expressed in different ways. If you express it against the white power structure, then the same thing can happen to you that happened in slavery. It will overpower you and destroy you. So that's why the police act as a reinforcer, just like they did the night patrols in slavery, to reinforce the, the, the power structure and the fear about something because of power. Now, if that's the reality, then you have the police brutality that you have. But if you don't want to encounter the law of the police, then what do you have to do? Where do you turn that anger? You turn it upon people who look like you and who are as helpless as you are in the process. And a lot of that goes back to the fact that I perceive that you have treated me with disrespect. So if you step on my shoe, that's an occasion to say you disrespected me and get even. If you look at me a certain way, like you think you're better than I am, that's an occasion. So these are the ramifications that we have within our own community from the handover or, or, or the ramifications in today's society for the traumatic experiences of slavery. That's a physical thing. The mental thing is that Colorism is used not only to divide us, but to say that we're less than. Mm -hmm. In the West Indies, in the Jamaican, uh, the British West Indies, they were very clever in using colorism. So people that were fair in complexion, which would be a mulatto or quadrone, they got privilege, privileges that other people didn't have. They could go to certain places, certain churches, certain schools, and so on. And they were held in higher esteem. And then hair texture came into it. So if your hair was not straight, then there was something wrong with it. So the idea is that the wrongness of our society is blackness. The wrongness in our society is kinky, nappy hair. You hear all those descriptive things for it. Now, there's nothing wrong with hair. If you have some, we can fix it any way you want it. The problem is either you have it or you don't have it. And I don't have it. So there's <laughs> nothing you can do. You can't attach anything here or do anything with this. But if you got some, we're going to work with it. We can make it work. So what I'm sharing with you is that these are traumas that are built in that still sustain us today. And unfortunately, until we recognize that these are imprinted traumas into us by someone else for their own advantage, the object, then we have to recognize as ourselves that this is not to our advantage. So I was very happy when they said black is beautiful. Yes. Now, what you have to understand is when we say an affirmation for ourselves, black lives matter, black is beautiful. The dichotomous logic of Europeans comes into play 
So if black is beautiful, white is what? Mm, the opposite. <laughs> yes, it's ugly. And oh. they said, are you saying white is ugly? He said, no, I'm just simply saying black is beautiful. Well, if black is beautiful, then you're saying that white is ugly. See, and then what they do to diffuse the power of black is beautiful. They say, well, brown is beautiful, yellow is beautiful. All of us are beautiful. Now, mm -hmm. black lives matter. Oh, are you saying that white lives don't matter? Mm -hmm. Now you get the posters, white lives, yellow lives, brown lives, all these are lives matter. <laughs> because the power of the statement, of the declarative statement of who I am, who we are, is nullified by their use of dichotomous logic. Is that helpful? Very, very helpful, very helpful. Wow, I am so amazed right now. Yes, so you have answered what were the psychological traumas of the enslavement period. Mm -hmm. And in our time, how can we free our minds from this colonialism and this neocolonialism? What can we do? We, we have to go back to our origins. Our origins don't start with slavery in the Western hemisphere. We have great history in Africa. Now, in order for the greatness and the skills and all the technology that was developed in Africa, you can't have the power of Western civilization being the greatest civilization in the world if people are gonna tell you that where you went to school was in Africa and that's how you got that information. So we have to claim our own. So what you have is you have maps that say, Egypt is a part of Asia Minor. No, Egypt is on the, con Egypt is on the continent of Africa, okay? Yes. Then they'll try to tell you that Egyptians were white. Well, if you know your history, Diop took scrapings from mummies in Paris to see how much melanin was in the skin. And those mummies, all 12 of them, were black. They weren't even a little bit yellow. And none of them was high yellow, okay? <laughs> okay? So now, when he got ready to go to Egypt to do the same thing, they said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You, you destroyed the mummy. Hmm. Now, how could you get the tissue in London and you didn't destroy the mummy? And now you can't do it because too many of those mummies would tell you how dark the people were. Yeah. Now, some were fairer than others, that's true. Some were much darker than others, but they weren't white people, that's okay? True. And they weren't Arabs. So when you understand your own history, now what Diop did, which was so fabulous, he's a tremendous person. He indicated that there was a, uh, a, just like in the United States, people went from the Atlantic all the way over to the Pacific, across the country, people did the same thing in Africa. So you have the West African people from which most of our slavery comes are the descendants of the people that were across the continent from them, from Egypt, from Ethiopia, and all those places. Now, nobody talks about that. Okay. Now, again, if you don't pay attention to what's happening and you don't know your history, you get all confused. They say it's impossible for this. They talk about the south and south of the Sahara. Okay. Well, what are they talking about south of the Sahara? Africa is one place. But by making when they say south of the Sahara, they're separating you from the Arab invasions of the north. At that, at one point, they were all black. In your Catholic Church history, the early popes, Pope Saint Victor, that formed the calendar and made Latin the official language of the church, was from North Africa. Well, now you're trying to figure out was he light or brown? No, he was black. <laughs> he was black. He wasn't brown. He was black, and all those popes were black. Now, if you recognize that then you liberate your mind from thinking that everything, only things that are good in the world came to us through white people. Now, what is current? What have we currently done as black people? What current information do we have? What have we done in modern science? 
Well, those things are kept from us. Let me give you something else though. White people still do not understand the Cyrus star. There's one star that comes, one satellite on this star, like a moon on this star that comes around every 70 years. The life expectancy of those people is about 20, 25 years and they die. So in 70 years, the memory of how to solve that problem is gone. There was a priest that went with him and stayed 35 years trying to figure out what they did and he still couldn't figure out. And he wrote a book called The, the Silver Fox. No, The Gray Fox, the, the Gray Silver Fox, Silver Fox. Okay. Now, what was it when that satellite came around, that, that movie, that moon came around in 70 years, the Europeans were so angry. How could you know? And we have these high powered telescopes and we didn't know. So again, the game is what you know, take it away from you and relabel it. When we talk about the, 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 the theorems, Pythagoras or, or Euclidean geometry, that's yeah. African. So we have to go back and claim our own. That's what we have to do. And our children have to be socialized in the reality that this is indeed our own. And the world starts with us first. And then people migrate out of Africa going to different places. And the last place to be a civilization or an ethnic group is Europe because the, they couldn't get into Europe to migrate until the end of the last ice age, which was only about 20, 25 years, 25,000 years ago. So my answer is know as much as you can about Africa. Modern day Africa is colonialized in the same way that uh, people in the islands were colonialized and the way that slavery was held in the United States. But now the colonialization, uh, you want to read the letter from Lynch. Willie Lynch. Yes, Lynch wrote a letter. He was a big slave uh, plantation owner in, in uh, Jamaica. And he went to the planters in Virginia and gave a one page letter, one page, and told everything that was necessary to divide black people and to keep them subjective. One page. Now, when you go and look at it, other people have added whole 10, 15 more pages to it, going into greater detail of how to do the same thing. Don't pay attention to that because that's not what Lynch wrote. Now, how do you know? You know by the vocabulary that Lynch used as opposed to the vocabulary these other people use. These other people coming after Lynch use the word nigger. When you go to the unabridged Oxford English Dictionary, nigger only comes into existence after Lynch. It doesn't come into the English vocabulary until after Lynch. So you have to be able to interpret and see when people are adding extra things to it or something else. His letter is devastating. And if, if that would be something, would be a wonderful program to have someone go through and do the explicación or the uh, critical analysis of what is in that speech, because that is one of the things that still keeps us tied back and held in uh, confusion and fighting each other. Okay. Wow. Well, as <laughs> as as a Christian, uh, I I'm just saying this without um, preparing you for this question. But how will that this knowledge, this new knowledge of our history, how will it affect our perspective on, on life really? Um, especially as, as Christians, how will this affect our theology? Well, as Christians, we need to go back to Africa in a temple and the Nile. There's a woman kneeling and an ankh is pressed to her nose. That's foretelling the immaculate, that's foretelling the, the uh, virginal birth of Christ, the pure birth of Christ. Christ was born without sin. It was the Holy Spirit that incorporated in, 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 um, incarnated Mary. All right? So the ankh held to the nose centuries before the coming of Christianity is foretelling you that there will be a virginal birth. 
of the Savior. Now, if you know that, then people can't tell you that Christianity is, is just starting with the British. Let me tell you one thing very quickly because our time is almost up. Yes. Queen Victoria decided that they needed to get into Ethiopia in order to colonize it. And so what they do is they send the missionaries first. So she was inviting the king there to have missionaries brought in to bring them Christianity. He sent a letter back to her saying, I thank you so much. It's a gracious concept. I want to enclose as a gift to you. It was a third century Bible. They were Christians in the third century. What was going on in England in the third century? The Romans were still occupying England. They were still running around in bear skins. You see? So if you know your history, you know all of this is game. So as a Christian, don't think that Christianity starts with the bringing of the colonization. It was in the Eastern part of, of Africa for centuries before it even got to England. And what they bring to us is a colonialized thing. What was the first picture of Christ that you saw? Was he black? No, <laughs> no, okay. not black at all. No, okay. Blonde now, hair, blue eyed. All right. Now I have a friend who is German, a priest. He came to visit me here in Washington. I took him to the temple that we have, the, the, the biggest uh, Catholic cathedral here, the Immaculate Conception. And in the nave, they have a, 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 a maze of gold and Christ is in a red cloak, blonde hair and blue eyes. And this blonde haired, blue eyed German priest said, that's too much. Christ was a Jew. In other words, Christ didn't look like that. He wasn't blonde-haired and blue-eyed. And here's this German priest saying, oh, this is ambition zu viel. Christus war eine Jude. Christ was a Jew. He couldn't have been looking like that. But yet when children go and see that, then they look at themselves. Then how can you be an angel? All these angels flying around. Do any of them look like us? No. That to say that we're not in heaven? Well, <laughs> then we have to change the image. Yes. We have to change the image. And of course, in some churches with that fan, you know, you can't bring no black Jesus in there and put on your grandmother's fan. <laughs> She'll be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> but that's socialization. We have to re-socialize ourselves. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Nichols. You're very I welcome. thank you. I thank you so much. Words cannot express how honored I am and how privileged I am having you sharing with us and getting the word out to our people so that we can come to value ourselves as you know we were created uh, to be valued. So I thank you so much. Do you have any final words for us as we think about emancipating our minds or ourselves from mental slavery or anything in general? Well, you have to remember that we are in competition with whites. And they are afraid if we are given equal rights, we will be too superior to them. In terms of all the oppression that we've had, we still outdo them in many things. And if we were given the proper education and health care, we would even be further. So it's a fear that whites will lose whiteness, which means privilege, and have to work just like the rest of us in order to accomplish goals and objectives. Wow. wow. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, doctor. Wow. I really appreciate this. <laughs> and I know you know some Dutch. <laughs> you, you, you speak Dutch fluently. No, I, I speak German fluently. But oh, I German. Can, yes, but I can say something like, Gute Tag <laughs> for the Dutch there. What does that mean? <laughs> Hello, like good day. Good day. Okay. Yeah, good day. So, Gute Tag. Okay. <laughs> so, Guten Tag in German. Yes, yes. yes. So, so I look forward, you, yes, I look forward to having part two with you on emancipating ourselves from mental slavery. 
we'll be looking at uh, black businesses as well and how do we own our own businesses etc and we will also be looking at the future for black children good good yes I look forward to that discussion tomorrow thank you once again for good sharing good. with us I have called my program al Kibulan Reclaimed Network as a means of reclaiming who we are and re-educating ourselves about who we truly are. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Okay, God bless. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.